Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, to uh, Luke Holman and Amy Lee. Uh, Amy, if you'd just pull yourself out. Uh, Luke, you all know, but Amy, some of you know and some of you don't. Uh, Amy is one of the program officers at the Kettering Foundation, which I've worked on and on, on and off with, on and on. Uh, on I think there was something there. Uh, no, I've, I've worked with the Kettering Foundation for a long time, and Amy has really taken them in an exciting new direction, uh, which is the direction of collaboration with Luke and Contenio. Uh, and that's uh, a little bit of the germ in this talk, and there's even a couple specific ideas that I really credit to them. So. Um, all of the smart things in the talk, you can attribute to them. For all of the dumb things, I'd actually like to list a few people. <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, the, the inspiration for this talk is the fact that everybody in this room uh, has organized people for various reasons uh, in the public sector and private sector uh, to discuss, to deliberate on some kind of an issue. And you surely all have the same experience that the group may have actually done something really worthwhile. If it was a well-structured discussion, it probably produced good results. But then what? What, what came of that? Uh, worse still, if they came up with something really good and nothing happened with it, uh, that's incredibly frustrating, both for you and for the participants. So the point of this talk was the inspiration, so what? So if Contenio and Kettering build a tool called Common Ground for Action, what's that going to actually do? If people find common ground, what next? So I took that idea and ran with it. And I think I ran way past the point that I can normally breathe. So this might be a little bit of a fever dream, what you're about to see. Uh, I hope you find it uh, interesting. Uh, honestly, my goal for this talk is I think there's enough in here that you're going to find something that sparks for you, something that strikes you as original, a way of looking or thinking that maybe you hadn't thought of. And that piece may be what you take away. As for the totality of it, we'll see what you think of that. So a little bit of biographical background to get a sense for where I come from uh, and why this talk is the way it is. Uh, there's two huge influences in my life. First of all, my wonderful parents uh, in their adulthood converted to Quakerism. Um, and uh, Quakerism instilled in us this love of dialogue, uh, really sincere listening, careful, you know, quiet space together, really sort of loveliness. Um, and you know, I picked up some of that and uh, kind of got the vibe. Uh, and have been sort of touchy-feely and groovy ever since. But both of my parents also did something unusual, which is I made a bumper sticker for them once that said, we're Democrats and we run for Congress. Because in 1976, my dad ran for Congress, and in 1992, my, ma my mom ran for Congress. In fact, I was influenced by the fact that I uh, managed my mother's campaign towards the end uh, and developed some skills that are quite different from what Quakerism cultivates. Um, when I uh, com completed my PhD, I really, I had a terrible joke I would tell, which is I have two unrelated specializations, democracy and American politics. Um, I try not to tell that joke so much anymore, though I couldn't help it today, but it really does give you the sense that I, I, I am bringing two very different streams, not just of ideology, but actually of research. Two whole completely different bodies about how people behave in bad circumstances and how they can behave in good circumstances. And I think that can be fused together in some powerful ways. Unfortunately, uh, the online world hasn't really reached its potential or come even close to its potential in terms of civic engagement. Partisan politics has always been quick to adopt new technology. Um, you know, robocalls came relatively quickly once you know, the phone bank uh, you know, got figured out. Um, all of these various uh, internet technologies now have been captured by partisan political interests. But true sort of more deliberative civic engagement hasn't thrived online. You're just looking at, for instance, the typical sort of political network online with the same divides, in fact, even more extreme than the interpersonal divides we find in the offline world. Oh, those, those are, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure those are blogs. Um, and the interconnections among them. But it actually could be a, more of a cognitive map. But the funny thing is, every time you study Republicans and Democrats uh, and do a network diagram, you get the same thing. So it's actually confusing. You look at the picture and like, now is that so-and-so's research or someone? They look at, this is the only funny thing. That, that's some little interesting little, maybe that's a proto Bernie Sanders right there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There was a joke I hadn't planned. And those are usually the best ones. All right. So let me just give you the basic idea. Here, here's, here's the pitch. Um, 
The basic idea is that I think we can actually build something, uh, I'll call it an online platform, I'm not really sure that's the right word. So I actually came up with a goofy name um, called the democracy machine. Um, and here's what I intend for this machine to do. There's a few basic problems in self-government, democracy, that have to be addressed, and among them are these. Uh, we need to control the agenda. We need to make sure that the issues that are actually getting attention in the political sphere are the most important ones. We need to draw in marginalized voices so that those we hear aren't just the usual suspects. We need to exercise good judgment together, not privately, but together. We need to make sure that the government is responsive to those deliberative judgments. A government that is responsive to the whims of the masses is not necessarily to be desired. And this is something that actually democracy does on a very slow time scale, but continuous system improvement. There have actually been dramatic changes in what democracy means, even just in the last 20 years, but really in the last two centuries. And you always have to assume that democracy is a work in progress. There is no such thing as a fully realized democracy. So those things are some of the things I hope to capture through this thing I'm calling the democracy machine. Um, and bear with me for this quick summary. I'm going to give you a lot of detail. Let's put it this way. We would build an online space that brings together the interests of civic leaders, marginalized citizens, and government officials and agencies. Government's need for public consultation can fuel kind of the, the heart of the process, where we bring citizens in for empowered public deliberation. That deliberation, in turn, can broaden uh, the, the kinds of voices we hear and ultimately create better outcomes, not just for the public, but for the government itself. We want better ideas. We want strong advice and, and decisions that are representative, but ultimately what government is shooting for is legitimacy. Legitimacy is in decline in this country, and some recent surveys have actually been very uh, scary about the rising percentage of young people in this country who don't even think democracy is necessarily a, a good idea. So there are all sorts of things that we want to get out of this machine. So let me walk us through it, and at the end I'll revisit a couple things that we might actually get beyond those initial goals. So the place I start with the machine, that little government crank there, it's a milling machine, which is probably a terrible metaphor, but it's actually better than I thought it would be. Um, uh, government actually does reach out to the public. Uh, we say all sorts of cynical things about government, but the people who actually populate government for the most part are interested in the public, and they actually often find it hard to reach the general public in a meaningful way. We just had a mayor in this room, if any, there are any doubters left, who really is genuinely interested in this, and the participatory budgeting happening tomorrow is an example of government reaching out. But it's really just one example of something that's actually quite, quite general. The way the democracy machine would be built is by tapping in to those agencies and officials who are actively reaching out for the public. It would start with those projects where we have a reasonable expectation of responsiveness if we give a meaningful and thoughtful output. So it would actually make sense to probably start at a locale like San Jose or Santa Clara County and build out from there. Then why not go to San Diego? I hear it's lovely. Um, um, and it actually makes sense to start, uh, though California is a bit crazy because it's not a state, it's a nation. We could argue about that. But it yeah. does have these densely packed counties that can kind of add up and pretty soon you've actually got a population in the democracy machine for state level questions. Build up from local up to state. Then you know you could jump around. You could go to Boston, DC. I think Flint, Michigan might be calling. Um, you know, maybe Detroit too. Um, and you build up from locales to build up states and then probably move to the national level. I, people always want to talk about reforming national politics and Congress and all that, and I just think that's exactly backwards. In the end, you hope that you do, in fact, have a democracy machine populated by the entire uh, sort of broad population as sampled in a complicated way. How you get a diverse population in there is one of the tricks I'm going to show as we walk through it, but that really is the aspiration. All right, how does it work? What you're looking at here is a chart I'm going to keep coming back to in this talk to look at different parts of the process. The idea is that, again, it starts with officials and agencies. Uh, they offer a measure of power or at least influence to participants to draw them in. They're then motivated because there is something really at stake to go through this process. 
The outputs we've talked about are things like potentially shaping rules, laws, budgets, and actually a lot more than that. Um, and then ultimately, uh, the outcomes of the actual policies can be fed back into the systems. The citizens themselves can make judgments about whether the action that followed is responsive. Because everyone's connected up in this machine, that feedback is much more effective. It's not a government official holding a press conference and hoping that somebody who reads the article that might have come from the press conference is one of the people, you know, no, these things are connected much more directly. And ultimately, there's feedback back into the system and even feedback back into the agency. More about that later. First, I, I want to convince you, in case you didn't know this, that actually there's all sorts of ways in which government is compelled to reach out to the public. I'm even going to estimate how much government spends on this, though that turns out to be very difficult. Um, uh, the Government has federal regulations that require public participation. I'm not saying it's necessarily done well, more on that coming. Uh, but they are actually compelled to hold public hearings and all sorts of e-rulemaking and comment periods and so on. And you might recognize this, for instance, with the Environmental Protection Agency, but it's really actually a pretty generic thing at the federal level. And at the state level, it's not really much different. That same mandate for public consultation is common at the local level, too. Um, here in Santa Clara, it's sort of right into the mission statement, public participation. Um, again, I, we have such cynical views often about government, and some of those are borne out by experience. But there is also this parallel reality of the government being compelled to consult us. Um, now, you might wonder, okay, what does this really add up to? Uh, well, I've actually tried figuring this out. I've talked to some people who know a lot more about this kind of thing than I do, and the answers I get from them are, are two. One is we have no idea how much is actually spent on public outreach. And if you're curious why I suddenly jumped from the will to include the public to the actual cost of it, I, I want to put money in this machine. This democracy machine isn't just sort of a pipe dream of software. I actually want it to be something that's sustainable, where funds are actually coming in to maintain it and even develop it. And then potentially there will even be surplus funds for other purposes. But that's why I'm trying to guess this number. The other response I get from people who know a lot about this sort of thing is, it's not just that they don't know the number, they don't want to know the number. Because they're afraid if the public found out how much we probably spend on public consultation, the public might think that's too much. Um, well, here's my best guess. And this is based on a few things. There is relatively hard data on how much money the federal government actually spends on all of its meetings, all meetings of government officials, which include lots of things that have nothing to do with the public. Uh, and we also know some numbers about how much the federal government spends on advertising and public relations, thanks to kind of an investigative study that came up with a figure. It's about a billion bucks a year. Um, and extrapolating from that and a few other things, I wind up with figures like this. Uh, that state and local spending is probably roughly the same or a little bit more than federal spending on public engagement, just because you have so many units of government. That in a sense, there's kind of an inefficiency to their public outreach. Um, California obviously has a huge share of the state and local spending. That number, again, is, is using some ratios that I based on federal government outreach. Um, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of one to three billion. What I decided is to end the search, we're probably gonna do a FOIA request, but I'm ending the search just because I feel like I have the magnitude. It's probably somewhere around a billion bucks. Probably 100 million is low, probably 10, mil 10 billion is high, but we honestly don't know. But there's a lot of government spending going on here, and the democracy machine would love to take a chunk of that and actually create efficiencies for government and improve the consultation they're doing. Now, surveys suck, <laughs> surveys suck uh, but actually you're going to find that they have a role in here because the word survey is bigger than that statement would suggest. Um, much of that money is not well spent. In fact, some of it is spent on bad surveys. Um, but uh, some of it's spent very well, and I think the uh, San Jose participatory budgeting uh, experience is a good example. But public hearings are the, probably the most recognizable form of government outreach. Um, and public officials. I, they suck. They really know that these things have serious limitations. I actually like this photo because if I was a government official, just looking at that, I would think, that was probably one of our better ones, right? I mean, people are, <laughs> there's a decent audience, right? It seems like people might be listening. But the very, the very setup of the interaction is not encouraging. Uh, the, the stereotype is unfortunately often true that these meetings are really tell and sell. I'm going to tell you what we're doing, and I'm going to sell it to you, and there's no real latitude for you. 
There can be incredible kinds of public meetings. And you know, the, the public engagement deliberation community was estimated by a survey a couple years ago. There's a, there's a book on this subject that you might find interesting um, called, uh, uh, what is the book? Um, shoot, uh, Do-It-Yourself Democracy. Uh, you might find 36 million is the estimate in there from the organizations that were surveyed. I think that estimate's way low. But the point is, those organizations are actually doing all kinds of interesting engagement and delivery. So there's actually a chunk of that, if I'm right about a billion, a chunk of it that's really good. But this is good for a public hearing. Now, unfortunately, this happens. This is a real photo of a real public hearing. And this is the bummer if you're a public <laughs> official is, you know, you, you don't get to show up at 7 o'clock and just leave because nobody came because you're there from 7 to 8.30. Um, so this can be a kind of humiliating exercise, but it is preferable to the slide you know is coming next, right? Um, the, these things can easily devolve uh, and, you know, the public hearings on uh, the proposed uh, health care reforms from the Obama administration uh, are what's in the mind of a lot of public officials when they think about public meetings. <laughs> They're scared. They, they fear an engaged public. Um, and increasingly, uh, when exposed to some kind of an alternative, there is a tremendous receptiveness to it. So again, the democracy machine is capitalizing not just on the facts that our government has to consult with us, but that existing methods of doing so are not necessarily effective. Now, will that draw people in? is a great question. You know, we, we need to be concerned that uh, just because it's a good idea doesn't mean people will flock to it. Um, I think the evidence is pretty good that uh, there are different publics that actually I think we, we could draw in with some confidence. Um, if you think of it in terms of sort of target markets, digital natives I think are going to come pretty quickly to this. And we've already seen evidence that, you know, people when they feel that they can be connected to something that is meaningful, and usually it has an element of fun or enjoyment, um, it can really get people excited. But th this is not a new phenomenon, right? I mean, people have organized, mobilized historically for all kinds of reasons, but they really come down to knowing that they can get some kind of identity and connection out of it and probably have some real impact. Uh, that's what the democracy machine has to provide. It can't just be a way of conducting deliberative forums and giving some sort of formal output to public officials. It has to have these more compelling features and experiences for people. So what actually happens inside it, right? That's the important question, is, is, uh, is it worth bringing all these people together? What's it going to actually produce? So again, I tip the hat to the Kettering Foundation and Contenio, uh, because they have actually built something that was kind of the inspiration for this exercise, uh, Common Ground for Action, which, which how many people in the room have actually touched this already? OK, most of you have, a few of you haven't. I'll just say a couple words about what it is. Uh, roughly speaking, imagine that when you got together to talk about an issue, there were always at least three choices, not a left and a right, and that those three broad options actually had several actions within them. And you were asked to consider each of those actions and consider a serious potential drawback for each of those, and then talk through those one by one together, and then start to look at what you've produced together. Right? This is sort of a, a space that represents what maybe is at the center, the things that you've actually found some common ground on. And in this case, it's a great example of finding common ground from actually three different options that aren't mutually exclusive, but are potentially complementary. Um, uh, 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 something that doesn't get talked about as much is sometimes there's interesting strong points of disagreement that get revealed. They're not on the common ground, but people feel very strongly and differently about them. I actually think you could build a separate process for just exploring those. Um, but you can get really creative with this sort of thing. One of the things, just a couple notes here, one of the things that Luke is especially interested in is the idea of the moderator. Over on the left, there's sort of ongoing chat. It's not just clicking buttons and rating things. You're actually talking about it. Um, he thinks that could be automated to a fair extent. A, a facility bot or a modabot um, could actually do a lot of that functionality. Uh, I won't dwell on that, but I think that's interesting to think about when you potentially scale this up. I think there's a role for the people in the democracy machine to facilitate each other, but that's probably not going to be enough. So I think that's an interesting idea. Um, another thing to think about with this is really, again, uh, when this deliberation ends, what has it produced? Well, at the, at the level of the actual forum, which is probably just about eight people, all it produced was some sense that we eight people have something in common. And again, that, that can be actually very satisfying until you start to wonder again about this so what question. What did I just accomplish? Where does this go? 
But now imagine that that's replicated and replicated, and there's all sorts of incentives in the democracy machine for people to be in very diverse groups where discovering common ground is kind of surprising and refreshing. And you start to see patterns and discontinuities, but that that aggregates up to something. So when you're actually asked to evaluate the process, you're not just saying, how was your forum? You're saying, what do you think of where we've arrived as a collective, as the people of San Jose in this machine, or the people of California? Excuse me, California. Sorry, <laughs> that joke's still not old. It's, it's getting there, but it's still sweet. Pumping gyan is how you say it. Pumping gyan. Just put the G on the I and it sounds great. Um, but seriously, you're actually reflecting on what you have collectively arrived at, and then ultimately reflecting on how government responds to that. Again, all connected through this online world. So the deliberation is at the center of it, but that's not all that there is. Now, it's, it's a metaphor here a little bit, but think about the people in this engine, the citizens in this democracy machine. Think about them accumulating credits. Again, this idea is so abstract that I have no idea if that will actually contact reality. But it works pretty well at explaining it. You'd be accumulating credits, and we'll talk about what you'd spend them on. But you'd get them for all sorts of things. My wife calls it political bitcoin. That makes me nervous. It has no transferable value. So, but I had to give a tip of the cap, wag of the finger at the same time. Um, first of all, uh, you can play collaboration games. They're built right into it, and all kinds of existing software can't emphasize enough. This is really about integrating things as much as building things. Uh, you get some credit for that. They'll develop a little bit of skill. Prediction markets are a really fascinating way of learning without realizing you're learning. You know, you're going to get killed on your bets on Bernie Sanders if you're not keeping up with the news. Um, so you have to kind of keep paying attention to what's going on. But these don't just have to be which candidate is up and down. There was a wonderful game called Play the News, uh, which was uh, done by a company that did an award-winning game on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There's all sorts of games that can get you to think about things and be rewarded for guessing correctly. And it's hopeless if you don't read the news. Um, but also then ultimately participating in the deliberation itself. Uh, before that, you might actually, though, get warmed up with, uh, though he hates them, there are actually very different kinds of surveys. And some of them force you to engage with issues. Uh, in fact, Luke and I have been having conversations about a deliberation by yourself. What would that look like? Well, it's kind of a survey, but it's a really good survey. Um, then, of course, deliberating. But you don't just get. You don't just get points for showing up for the deliberation. You're also evaluated by the other deliberators. And in a, in a sense that uh, sort of champions and other role-playing gamers will appreciate, the more difficult the setting, the more potential experience points. Right? <laughs> so uh, if you're in a diverse group and you find common ground, good for you. That was a challenging uh, scenario, and you did well. Um, but again, uh, there's a lot more you can do to get credits, but they can't be purchased or exchanged. Right? You are accumulating them for you yourself in this democracy machine. All right. Now, what do you spend them on? Right? Where do they go? Um, well, all kinds of things. Uh, there is a voting aspect in this game, uh, so to speak, or this machine. And you can actually vote on proposals, use your credits to do that. I don't know that you get to vote multiple times. But it might cost you a credit. You're saying, this is important enough to me. I love deliberating on it. And now that we have an actual proposal, I'm going to vote on that and use one of my credits. Um, you can potentially place and rank things on the agenda. You've got to level up pretty high to start putting things on the agenda, but helping to rank the many things that are coming in, and you can't give them all your attention. Another thing you could spend credits on. Um, petitions and so on. Um, potentially, the machine might even start generating a surplus. You might actually allocate that. The city might not only get your opinions, but you might actually take some of your machine's surplus value and put it into projects. Um, and a lot more. But I, I already said, I gave away leveling up, and so I want to jump there. Uh, for those who love and hate PowerPoint, uh, it is amazing what it takes to slowly reveal a table in PowerPoint. Good heavens. I learned it good today. Uh, so at level one, you're just a registered user. You got to register to get in there. You're still anonymous. We don't know that you're really who you say you are, but I want a very, very low barrier to entry. And all you're doing is playing games and taking surveys, which Luke is skeptical of anyway, so that's a, that's a good level one activity. To get to level two, you've got to accumulate enough credit to cross the threshold. Now you can start doing more interesting things. You can join into focus groups, full-fledged deliberations. Once you've done enough deliberation, you can actually join an alliance. And it's super important to join an alliance. That's where the credits start rolling in. Those who play these ridiculous phone games that take up too much of your life, you know what I'm talking about. You don't join the alliance. You're not really getting the crystals and things you need. Uh, so yeah, you've got to do that. Got to get to that threshold. 
Now here's the real kicker. This is one of my favorite things about this. I, I just can't emphasize it enough. Um, it might cost a certain number of credits, perhaps quite a few credits, to have the democracy machine mail a postcard to the address you enter that then has a code that you go back in and confirm you really are that person who is a registered voter at that address and belongs to that political party. This is important for a bunch of reasons. Uh, and you don't have to do it. You can be in the machine and never do that. Uh, but for all kinds of reasons we could get into in q and I think it's extremely valuable to validate the person. Um, and uh, we'll touch on a couple of those later. Um, all right, you can actually start hosting deliberation uh, uh, at that point. Uh, but then once you've done that enough, um, you can actually start forming new alliances. You may not like the one you're in. You want to start a new one, become an officer. And one of the ultimate forms of feedback, it's all well and good to have someone in a deliberation say, you know what, you were kind of a jerk. I didn't enjoy that. It's something else for have, to have an alliance officer say, yeah, we don't need you anymore. So there are all kinds of feedback. And that's a real thing in these environments, right? You get kicked. We said we were all going to work on this quest. You didn't do anything. Goodbye. We are an active alliance. Go join that friendly one, right? They don't do much. Um, so it creates a real feedback mechanism you care about. The ultimate feedback mechanism in this, by the way, is uh, I don't, I'm not going to go there. But there could be reasons that you would actually be booted from this, um, behavioral and so on. That's extremely costly because you'd lose your whole profile. You'd have to start from scratch back at level one. So real incentives to, to kind of play along. Um, Part of what you can do at that point, recruiting members, is one of the things that you actually need to do to get to the next level, is you need to actually start recruiting people, drawing people into the machine who aren't there yet, right? You do that, and you surrender your anonymity. This I know is a, a matter of contention. I'm pretty sold on the research that says there are actually ways in which anonymity is great, and there are other ways in which it is really fueling a lot of problems. I think we're in the machine here, we're getting the best of both worlds. We're letting you keep your anonymity if you choose to, but if you want to do higher order functions, we need you to cross that threshold. And the game will be populated, I don't mean to call it a game, I'll just keep calling it a machine. It will be populated by lots of people who have given up their anonymity, which creates an interesting mixed setting. But once you reach that level, you can actually now start to forge coalitions, more about that in a second, and you can start to actually prioritize existing agenda items. That's that function you wanted to spend credits on, but you've got to get to a pretty high level to start setting what's on the agenda within the machine. At level seven, you've gotten even more credits accumulated, uh, and you've been reviewed by a local board in a very limited sense. A threshold for board approval would be very low, but if there had been a pattern of problems or something, there, you might run into a problem. Uh, we could drop that if you hate it. Um, the point is you can actually now at this level start to bring issues into the agenda, help to frame issues on the agenda. As you start getting up to levels eight and nine, you're really becoming a leader, a real leader in this organization. Earlier, uh, if you're an opinion leader, you can do all sorts of stuff at these levels. But when you're up here, you're actually kind of ready to join the, the highest order team. Um, you might be on a local board or a national board. You might be reaching out to public officials, doing all kinds of exciting stuff at this highest level in, in the democracy machine. Now, there's a bunch of things I've alluded to that I'm going to walk us back to to get a better feel for. One of the things I want to emphasize is that we get some people involved initially, but then the machine itself creates all these incentives for involvement. And what we're trying to do is here reach out, if you want to call them second order opinion leaders. These are people who aren't opinion leaders, but could be. They're the kinds of people who I think will get recruited by people in the machine to enhance its diversity. Um, look at a few things here. First, you can, you can forge these alliances, as I said. Now, these alliances, I'm imagining, are often going to be from people who have common backgrounds, interests. You know, hey, people in southern Florida who like the sunshine, you join my alliance, right? That's fine. And I don't want to regulate that. It's actually nice to have a place you can go inside this machine where you might have some like-minded people, at least initially. Um, then there are quests that award massive amounts of credit if you can recruit new registrations to diversify the alliance. Um, now, diversify can mean a whole bunch of things. But because you are address validated at some point, we start to get a sense for where the democracy machine is, is strong and where it's weak. Right? You can actually go all the way down to the census block or the precinct, both roughly around 1,000 people per. So we could get really interesting micro-targeting information that helps us know we really need to recruit people. Here. And the value of recruiting people from underrepresented communities is dramatically higher than bringing in one more person from a precinct that's already heavily represented. So again, structured ways of getting data in there can actually help us with the diversification. The alliances then get huge credit for forging coalitions that bring together divergent alliances. And these coalitions, in turn, can really get the big credits 
when they wind up forging common ground across people who are very different. If you haven't seen it yet, you can see why I care so much about the voter registration confirmation. I have much greater confidence that when you say you're a Democrat, you're an actual Democrat, if I've confirmed your voter registration. Doesn't work in every state, but there's a reason to start with California. And yes, I realize some people register for the other party just to be cheeky. That's actually statistically not a very common thing. Somebody in this room has surely done it, but I can live with that. You can't have everything, all right? Okay. So that's a pretty basic description of how the guts of this thing works. As we start talking about outputs, the things that come out of it, uh, you're going to start seeing these things, sort of virtuous cycles. Um, think of it this way, all right? Citizens are generating these ideas. They're shaping policy. They're shaping budgets. That's all great. And then they're actually evaluating that. They're, they're evaluating how responsive government was to the things that they uh, gave to it. That, in turn, actually can be fed back into the government when it thinks about whether it wants to participate again. Let me give you some concrete things to think about, some feedback loops here. First of all, uh, this is my favorite thing, uh, coupons. <laughs> so if you are uh, the EPA and you do a big old national cons consultation on toxicology and you have some regulations that you want them to consider and you have some alternatives and you get some very strong common ground feedback, and you write regulations that are responsive to that in a substantive way, not just responding to the masses, but really creative ideas and so on, the machine evaluates, these are actual people, evaluating your responsiveness. And if you did a good job, essentially the machine says to you, hey, that was great. We had a good time. Glad we helped. You want to come back? It's half off. Right? And now you've actually just reduced the cost for those very agencies that you expect to be responsive in the future. So it's a feedback loop I'm kind of in love with, but, you know. You know how love is. Um, there also might wind up being implicit and explicit endorsements, potentially. If a public official is consistently reaching out to the machine and being very responsive, that, that could be very helpful to their career. It's not inconceivable that, especially at the local level, though potentially in some national uh, efforts, say a big mental health campaign, people might actually want to do more. The point isn't just to make laws. The point is to also think about how we're behaving. This is a very long-term, not quite a social movement thing, but it is about the public's role in solving problems beyond what the government can do for us. Uh, and then finally, uh, an amazing thing that this thing keeps doing, as you keep cycling through these things, you're developing capacity, all kinds of skills and empathy and so on, which I think are very transferable, not just to the next issue that comes into the machine, but to all kinds of things, potentially. So it could be a really powerful way of developing some of those skills. Um, all the way from the smallest little games to the really more powerful deliberative challenges you face. And then really thinking about the long-term impact of a policy, especially on a challenging problem where your feedback is only going to come in dribs and drabs over months or years. All right. So things flow into the machine. Yes, please. Isn't the challenge uh, part of it that um, um, this get the loop becomes manageable and short-term interests over the long term? Well, this is the problem, is a, a soundbite is a way of feeding back into the public system through mass media, through a diffuse communication system and so on. If you say back to the democracy machine, I just gave you what our children deserve, the machine will say, that was terrible. I, I have no idea what you meant. What did you actually do? You know, you will be punished uh, for your wickedness. Um, and you, you can see this in some interesting processes. I'll digress for just a second. If you, if you are feeling glum, fortunately, a colleague and I just had a piece in the Washington Post today, which is about some of the more encouraging forms of citizen innovation. Participatory budgeting, you're probably more familiar with. But in Oregon, the Citizens Initiative Review, it's actually something that has been sort of thought about here for California. The Citizens Initiative Review uses 24 citizens to evaluate a ballot measure. Imagine if every time you were voting in your voting guide, there was a page written by fellow citizens who had studied the darn thing for a week, had heard from pro and con, some neutral witnesses, and said, here's what you really need to know before you vote on Proposition 67. Yeah. What's the difference between women League of, uh, the League of Women Voters that does supposed to have this? They don't produce substantive content. The League of Women Voters Voting Guide provides a forum in which candidates can put statements and so on, but they won't touch it. Now, they love the Citizens Initiative Review, and they actually help do some of the piloting and for it and so on, but the whole point is who writes that statement? Is that someone you can trust? And in a sense, citizens are writing the statement for citizens, and that you're taking advantage of that. My point, there's two points about the Citizens Initiative Review. One is the sound bites are a disaster at the Citizens Initiative Review. If you try telling these 24 people you should support mandatory minimum sentencing because it's what we need to be a safe society, 
They all look at each other and say, I'm sorry. I, what are you actually saying? Right? If you make a claim, you realize we save $5 for every dollar we spend on incarceration? I'm sorry, that, is that in the binder? Wait, what study is that? The other side says it's a buck two. This is a real thing from one of the first CIRs. As they say, you actually save two cents on the dollar. That doesn't strike us as very important, but what's your, you know, and they had no study. They never actually referred to that statistic again, right? So the five-day process is brutal to sound bites. The democracy machine is like that. You get chewed up if you don't come back with real substance. And people get better and better about saying, how did you actually change the regulation? Yeah? So I was with Terrain, but now what I'm hearing is it's kind of like Wikipedia. If you post something in Wikipedia and it's factually incorrect about a topic that has even moderate right. interest, the, the, the crowd of eyes will fix the Wikipedia entry. And if you consistently do that, you'll get new. So the democracy machine in, in this little bit has a little bit of a Wikipedia in it, in the sense that you throw something in there that's incorrect or infactual it would actually machine it out. But, kind of like but it relies on variation in the sense that Wikipedia is global versus in the city situation, it's very local. Right. And, and therefore, a, a self-select song. And you get the mass that would be. Right, there. right. So, for example, right. in schools, uh, hey, I don't want schools integrated. Right, right. Might be a, and, 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 right. And, and that might show up as outcome. Right. Because the, the voting machine says, so let, let me jump in, you guys. I, I'm partly managing time, but I, you're back again to why I care so much about the voter registration validation. I'm out happy to let anyone into the machine, but when I'm outputting results, I want to stratify those. If 90% of the machine belongs to the Republican Party uh, in Santa Clara County, which I believe is 42% Dem, that's not going to fly. They're all welcome to vote, but I'll stratify it when I... Right? So I want that validation. And that's why there's only certain things you get, before, you know, you have to cross that threshold. Um, and there's more to it than that, but that's my favorite one. Yeah? Just when you say I'll stratify for you. Uh, I, essentially the machine. I, I can use voter registration statistics. I mean, I know what the voter registration distribution is in Santa Clara County, in California. That's a knowable thing. That's an actual physical record. Census is the same way. So I can stratify based on census data and voter registration data, and I'm pretty comfortable that those are real numbers. You get to whether somebody voted in Florida in, in, you know, in 2000, that's another question. <laughs> but I actually trust the registration statistics generally. But ultimately, it's a human group or person has to decide what the relationship between those two things is, what rule applies. Yes and no. Yes and no. I think that can be self-regulated a little bit. Uh, but the standards for these things are pretty straightforward. You tend to use voter registration and just a couple demographics that aren't subjective demographics, but... Yeah, but if it was 42 and 90, that's clear. If it's 42 and 60, right. is that a rule? Or is that too much? Like, well, that's too much because you have a big chunk of independents who need to be represented, so, right? So how do you decide what the right thing is? Who decides? Uh, I, I think there's a... You could say what's the... Uh, how exactly do you weight people? Which exact demographics? And how much do you, you know... How much do you care about these different things? That's all fair game. It's in the weeds. If you're asking that question, I'm excited because it means you're already thinking about that. The point is the point of dysfunction in American democracy with gerrymandering, et cetera, is at some point somebody decides what the group is, and uh, then whatever happens within that group, it's wrong because the group's been designed to be undemocratic. Right. The advantage we have here is that we're actually talking about municipalities, counties, and states, the lines of which aren't redrawn, except in very dramatic sort of annexation kinds of ways. Okay, but in a sense you're drawing a line somehow. I'm using lines that are already drawn and are pretty conventional. That's why I'm more comfortable with that. Um, and party registration and a few demographics, zip code, educational level, uh, so on. It gets tricky as educational level is a good example. Well, what am I going to use? Am I going to use your report on that? So that's why I love voter registration. It's one thing that I is recorded. Yes, you can say a different party, but you don't generally. Um, and so on. It's, I'm not saying it's not without challenges, but it's, it's a thing. All right, so uh, just a few examples of things that go in uh, are up there on the screen. The only one I'll uh, draw your attention to is, uh, and Luke, of course, has been thinking about this. 
what we're describing is actually not necessarily a civic engine. That's what I'm interested in. I study political communication and so on. There's no reason a large organization couldn't benefit from doing the same thing. And it actually wouldn't run into the kinds of problems we're arguing over right now aren't necessarily the same when you don't have as much privacy. And they actually know who you are and where you're from and all that right at the outset. They even, in fact, they have the universe of email addresses already built into their database. So they might find something like this incredibly powerful and interesting. I think the civic problem is the one that's compelling to me, but anyway. As I said before, it could even be that there ultimately is surplus revenue, which would not just be spent by the folks in the machine, but also would go into continuous improvement of it. Um, so uh, back to the kinds of original problems that animated this. I actually, when you think about it, I think there are some things it does that are beyond what I initially was hoping for. Uh, one of those is, for the reasons we've just talked about, I actually think you're going to increase voter registration. It creates a very specific and tangible benefit for voter registration. Um, it's much more powerful than the fear that you'll get put on a jury if you register to vote. Uh, by the way, uh, every place in the US now, it's driver's license and voter registration. So you have to tell those people they got to double down and get rid of their driver's license if that's really a big fear. Um, it really could build enduring uh, bridges. And, and I, I can't emphasize enough, it, the incentives have to be really strong for diversification. You really need to for the success of your alliance and your coalition, reach out into underserved uh, communities, which again, we use that same demographic data, uh, zip code and, and political party and so on, to get you there. Um, it might actually start making people a little more realistic and thoughtful about what can be accomplished. One of the things that, that for Luke really motivates this kind of thinking is the problems that don't have short-term solutions. And to continuously be getting dribs and drabs of feedback that is substantive and is responsive, but it's kind of humbling in terms of what can San Jose actually do about homelessness in the next six months. That can be sobering, but if it really is substantive and seems engaged with the kinds of concerns you have and the kinds of experiences you have, that actually could be uh, sort of empowering in a sense that you start to recognize that you are going to have to be part of this long-term solution to one of these really challenging, some say wicked, problems. Um, it would certainly make public voice more articulate and sharper. Um, and I think it could potentially change the relationship between the public and the government in a way that really does build legitimacy. Um, and it could even actually, as we develop more patience for these long-term solutions, we could actually wind up shifting our political agenda to really put those at the top of it. So, Last words. Where on earth would you begin for this fever dream, crazy democracy machine? Um, can't stress enough existing technology. We've already invented a lot of this stuff, but it's not hooked up. So often it's one thing for one place and it's gone. The software may even no longer be supported, let alone all the information and insight and everything just dissipated, right? So leverage existing relationships, you know, and, and that means relationships with people in government. You know people that work at agencies and so on, these so-called bureaucrats and so on, that actually care about these things. And that's why I stress you really start locally, you build out from there, and then slowly expand. That's the vision. And that's, I think if you were to build it, that's where you'd have to start. Thank you so much for your time. Again, th special thanks to Amy and Luke for being here, but for all of you for your attention, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>